Thank you very much for the invitation. So I just wanted to say uh, two sentences about um, our new research institute. So we support visits to Australia to work with someone in Australia, not necessarily in Sydney, of between one and four months. And so if you're interested in working with someone in Australia, please consider uh, doing so through the Institute. So I'd also like to thank the organizers for this invitation because it was, uh, I was basically forced to write these notes. And, uh, and some, somehow in the last three or four years, I've been forced to write a number of surveys and so I decided not to write another survey, but to try to uh, go off into the unknown. This was very useful for me. Uh, and so in some sense, this talk will be half a, a looking back talk and half a looking forward talk. So this subject uh, is very closely related to a talk that was not given here in 1997 by Wolfgang Zergel. So he was invited and uh, he arrived at Boston Immigration and was told he could not enter the US and immediately got on a plane and had a sad trip back to Germany. Uh, and I'd heard this story from many people and somehow I, I imagined that he'd said something very rude to the border agent or that, so he loves wearing bare feet for example, and I imagine that maybe he got off the plane barefoot and the board, border agent said, there's no way you're coming into the United States in bare feet. But it turns out that I think he just didn't get the correct visa. So much more b boring, <laughs> boring explanation. So here is a mystery, perhaps. So you can look at it for a little bit and try to decide what it is. Say again. Pascal mod three. Very good. Pascal mod three. This is Pas so I take Pascal's triangle, I reduce it mod three. Blue dots are one, red dots are two, and white dots, which are only very, very barely visible, are zero. Okay. So the res I've done this a few times, and the response rate is always different. That was quite a fast response rate. Um, what's this? So if you go back, you, you'll notice a similarity between these two, flicking back and forth. So all, all of the lightest dots in this picture become dots that are... No. Yes. Yeah. So this is the three-attic valuation of Pascal's triangle. So how often three divides this entry in Pascal's triangle. Okay. So it's the explanation of the first picture is the explanation of the second picture. And now uh, in this subject, uh, it's often useful to quantize. So let's just look briefly at what happens when we do this. So we consider with Gaussian binomial coefficients. Okay, so we just write the same formula for binomial coefficients except with Q numbers replaced with ordinary numbers. And Pasha, who is the master of the Q philosophy, has just entered the room. Uh, so just to remind you, N choose I is the number of I sets of one up to N. This um, quantum binomial coefficient is the number of k-dimensional subspaces of a, of a vector space over a finite field. Sorry? K is I, yeah. Thank you, yeah. And yeah, up to some factor that I won't make explicit, but... So what we can do is we can take uh, Pascal's triangle and instead plug in these numbers, the, well, these Q numbers, and what we can evaluate this at a root of unity and something very beautiful happens. So this is the same. So here I've taken the Q, number, the Q numbers, I've evaluated them at a third root of unity. 
And this is what I get. And so you'll notice that, so this is, you'll notice that there's quite a few, so for example, if you look up in this region, this perfectly approximates, so th this is something mod P, whoops, this is something uh, over C, and you have something over C approximating something mod P, something of the complex numbers approximating something mod P. But notice that the approximation is only partial, so this is good, whereas here, so the, the, the vanishing or non-vanishing behavior here is much more regular than it is here. So the, so the way that I would like to think about this picture here is that these two pictures are, are of a fractal nature, are, are of a self-similar nature, and this picture here is like the kind of first layer of this fractal. Yes. We can take this mod 3 and then we, we actually genuinely get the correct, the, the mod p vanishing. So this, these pictures are meant to be a kind of metaphor throughout this talk of what modular representation theory is like and what we're trying to do. So what is modular representation theory like? We often see a fractal nature, a self-similar nature, and this is often tied to the Frobenius endomorphism. So I found it remarkable in Svetlana's talk, in the, in the last talk, that we saw similar pictures to this. I never expected, given her title, to see something related to the talk here. So there's a fractal structure in in our categories of representations. And so this is kind of, in some sense, looking forward. That we still don't understand this particularly well. Uh, so situations in representation theory, uh, we, we, have, we have phenomena tied to different powers of P. So in this, uh, and then these intersect and we get some mixing that's very complicated, and we would like to separate this out into layers. And so this is um, so, this so called philosophy of generations, uh, and I think that this was first advocated by uh, George Lustig, and the archetypal example of this is Pascal's triangle evaluated at root of unity, the Gaussian Pascal's triangle evaluated at root of unity um, as opposed to Pascal's triangle modulo P. So I want to continue on the board for some time. So what we'll be discussing is algebraic representations, and I just want to do the case of SL2 in some detail. Uh, so G is SL2. So this is two by two matrices of determinant and here A, B, C, D are in some field K. So this field might be, for example, the complex numbers, and then we regard this as the kind of easy case, uh, or it might be a finite field or the algebraic closure of a finite field. And what we study is, so in representation theory, we study representation, so these are homomorphisms to GLV. So this is w ways that G can act on a vector space in a linear way. And depending on where you are in mathematics, you'll put different constraints on your representation. So, for example, if this is a topological group, you might want your representation to be continuous. If it's a Lie group, you might want your representation to be unitary. And what we're interested in are the representations that occur in algebraic geometry. And so we're interested in so-called algebraic representations.
So what that means in this talk is that V is finite dimensional. And rho is given by, uh, by polynomials. So we can think about this as just being a homomorphism into n by n matrices once we choose a basis, and this is given by some polynomials in A, B, C, and D. Okay, so these are the representations that show up in algebraic representations, in algebraic geometry. So we're, I mean, one way to think about this is we're kind of doing harmonic analysis in representation theory. Sorry, in, in algebraic geometry. So just uh, two examples. We could send G to A, B, C, D. So this is a perfectly good homomorphism, the identity homomorphism. This is called natural, the natural representation. Or another example is um, so this is an irreducible three dimensional representation. And as you can probably tell, we never actually write down matrices for these things, which is why I don't know this matrix. Well, I don't anyway. Um, so these are the kind of things that we're studying. And we would like to know, for example, how many simple representations are, are there, what are the characters of the simple representations, etc. Uh, so what's a more conceptual way of understanding this representation? So G acts on a vector space. This natural representation gives us an action on a two-dimensional vector space. And then G acts on. Nabla n, which is homogeneous polynomials. Of degree n. And if you choose a basis x squared, x, y, y squared, then and you write down the matrix, you get this one. So this was this is Nabla 1, and this is Nabla 2. And if P is 0, these are, are all simple. So they're all irreducible. They have no G invariant um, subspaces other than 0 and everything. And this is closely tied to the theory of, for example, spherical harmonics. When P is bigger than zero, then delta zero, delta one, sorry, nabla one, up to nabla P minus one, are all simple. But delta nabla P is not. And what's the reason for that? If we consider um, x to the p inside here, and we act on it, so this will go to something like ax plus cy to the p. But now, in characteristic p, we have the freshman's dream, which tells us that this is a to the p, x to the p plus c to the p, y to the p. And so, in fact, mm -hmm. this tells us that um, is a submodule. Okay, so this is not simple.
And a very fundamental theorem in the subject is that um, the theorem is that uh, each nabla n has a unique simple submodule. L to the n, and we get all simples in this way. And now, so this is very typical of the general situation. We have a parameter list that is the same as in characteristic zero, but we have some subtlety in the actual structure of the modules in characteristic p. Um, I guess, yeah, I should. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Say again. But there was, an, there, was, there was another question. Somebody else said something. Uh, so what, what Pasha is saying is that if, if this is a, um, if k is not algebraically closed, then it's possible that these won't be simple anymore, that the LNs won't be simple. So I should assume that I have enough elements in my field, basically. So let's just assume that, I mean, yeah, I mean, secretly I, I think about group schemes where this doesn't come up, but we assume that k is algebraically closed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. For example, a Frobenius twist would satisfy this. Uh, sorry? Yeah, not as algebraic representations, yeah. So I just want to, um, so if we, we can draw a picture where we have our Nabla 0, Nabla 1, Nabla 2, Nabla 3. And so this has a basis k, this has a basis kx, ky, this has a basis k, I mean, kx squared, kxy, ky squared. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking. These are my modules. Etc. Okay. And so now what we in this in this case we have the, a baby version of our kind of task in general, which is to locate the simple module inside this. And so we have kind of L0 inside this, L1, inside this, L2, L3. And so in these cases, this is everything. And I argued over here that we have this inside this. And then if you do the next, next case, you get a picture like this. Okay. Can you see the punchline? Yeah. So what we get is Pascal's triangle again. Okay, so what we're looking at is the first layer of Pascal's triangle. The red-blue distinction is just in that picture and not here. <laughs> There's no, yeah, it doesn't. But what does show up is the... Um, So in this picture, um, so in the subject, there's an extremely important filtration called the Janssen filtration. And this corresponds to the valuation, the p-valuation. A binomial coefficient. Yeah. 
Okay, so when we're looking up, up there, we're actually looking at, um, at the Janssen filtration on these nebula modules. And just briefly, uh, b before we said that it's important to consider this passage to quantum numbers and even to their evaluations at epsilon, where epsilon is a L fruit of... What am I doing? Thank you, David. Oh, now I is taken also. <laughs> M. So this was a passage that was important, going from Pascal's triangle to Gaussian, Gaussian coefficients to their specializations at, at root of unity. And so this is SL2. This would be the um, so-called quantum group. And this would be the Lustig form. of the quantum group. So in the quantum group, it doesn't make sense to specialize Q to be a value because it's over some rational functions in Q. But Lustig defined an integral form of the quantum group, um, and now it makes sense to specialize. And if we look at the representation theory of this object, so this is U epsilon of SL2, then it, its representation theory approximates the representation theory of SL2 in the same way that the, that the Pascal's triangle, the Gaussian Pascal's triangle at a root of unity approximates the mod P Pascal's triangle. Yes, that's a very good question. And I just want to briefly uh, mention true of all duality. So if you think about uh, algebraic groups in characteristic P, something like SL2, I think some of the fascination of the subject is that this is something like a Lie group and something like a finite group. So it has, all, it has for example, SL2 FQ inside it for all values of Q, so it has a whole lot of very interesting finite groups inside it. And at the same time, we can take things from Lie theory to understand it. So uh, you might think it's a little bit, little bit artificial to study a representation theory of an algebraic group, but it's a little bit like the way that it's much easier to study the representation theory of a compact Lie group than it is of a general finite, a compact connected Lie group than it is of starting a general finite group. Yeah. When you first meet finite groups, you think these are great, and then you realize they're very complicated. When you first meet compact Lie groups, you might think, oh, these are a little bit complicated, but then you realize after a while they're really great. It's similar, similar for algebraic groups. So Schur duality is a passage between the, the finite, between symmet the symmetric group and, um, and GLN. So, GLN acts on its natural module. So this is its natural module. And Schurweil duality is the statement that if I take the, nth, the mth tensor power of M, then this has two actions. So it has an action, very, a natural action of GLN, but it also has an action of SN, of SM, the symmetric group.
by permuting coordinates, and these are mutual commutants. which means that, for example, any endomorphism of this that commutes with the GLN action is a linear combination of permutations of coordinates. And so this establishes, this establishes a bridge between the algebraic representation theory, so this gives us a bridge between rep GLN, the algebraic representation theory of GLN, and the representations of symmetric groups. And in, you may or may not know that in characteristic P, our knowledge of the representation theory of the symmetric group is rather poor. So we know how many simple modules there are, and we know how to construct them, but we have, for example, no idea of what their dimension is. And it's also this question that was motivating um, Zergel's talk that he never gave in 97. Okay. And let me just say verbally that in order to affect this passage, we need to be able to decompose this module into indecomposable modules. And this leads to the theory of uh, tilting modules. which are the indecomposable sum ends of this tensor power. This is, these are the tilting modules. And if we understood tilting modules completely, then we would also understand the symmetric group completely. So, So when Shaw uh, was looking at this, um, he, Shaw was a PhD student of Frobenius, and Frobenius had written down the character table of the symmetric group, and I think uh, following Frobenius' suggestion, Shaw exploited this to understand the representation theory of GLNC over the complex numbers. Weil went the other way. He uh, was he developed the theory of uh, representations of compact Lie groups, and he then used this passage to go across and understand the symmetric group. So this is what Weil said in 1949 about why he became interested in representation theory. The wish to really understand what really, to, the wish to understand what really is the mathematical substance behind the formal apparatus of relativity theory led me to the study of representations and invariants of groups. So after the war, I think Weil came, uh, after the First World War, Weil had no idea what to do with himself, and there was this new theory of general relativity. And he was very excited by this, and he became, I think, very interested in what you can generally say about tensors on a manifold. And this led him, so... This led him to um, these kind of considerations. Okay, so now I want to go into the uh, structure theory of the representations of general algebraic groups, or general reductive groups. And I just want to emphasize a feature. So this is a feature that became clear when I was writing these notes, which it, it's somewhat... Uh, known, but I think that it's a, a very simple thing that should be exploited more. Uh, this is to do with the affine Weyl group. So if we have a root system, we can consider this determines a Weyl group given by, generated by the reflections in the roots, and we can consider the affine Weyl group, which is the the affine group generated by translations in the roots and the finite Weyl group. So here's an example of a root system. So we look at, so the, the finite Weyl group would be the symmetries of either of, so here's a square. If we look at the symmetries of this square, then we would get the finite Weyl group. And here's a diamond. If we looked at the symmetries of that diamond, we would also get the finite Weyl group. And what we consider is the subgroup of all affine transformations of this plane generated by this finite Weyl group plus arbitrary translations 
in any of these roots, which is an index to lattice in the gray dots that you see, see here. So that's one definition of the affine vial group. But what is rather beautiful is that you can also understand this as an affine reflection group. So it's generated purely by affine translations. And these translations are the reflections in the uh, hyperplanes that take integral values on co-roots. So um, here's a picture. So for example, the root here determines these hyperplanes, which are all perpendicular to this root. Okay. And so all of these hyperplanes are precisely representing the reflections in our affine vial group. Okay. And somehow this, this picture is now kind of takes us into something resembling geometric group theory because we can try to understand our group via its action on this plane, and uh, we can see that this group is a coxeta group, and we can understand it very, very well from this action. Uh, but th this is the feature that is, is extremely nice, and I think needs to be exploited a little bit more, is that for every subgroup, we have a natural reflection subgroup, which is given by dilations, instead of considering just translations in the root lattice, we consider translations in L times the root lattice. So W0 is the finite vial group, W1 is everything, and we get subgroups which have an inclusion if and only if M divides N. So here's my W1, my standard vial group, and then I get these W2, W3, W4. And so I get this remarkable chain of uh, reflection subgroups inside my, my affine vial group. And these are, we know that these are uh, relevant to representation theory, but I think that, um, so in representation theory, we know that the, the one associated to the, the prime of the characteristic that we're considering is important. So we know that W5 is important in characteristic five. But uh, what also seems to be the case is that W25 is also important and W125 is also very important. And I don't think we've used this as much as we could have. Okay, so that's the this, this philosophy, is that the, a lot of this fract fractal behavior that we see is tied to this chain of subgroups W1 containing WP containing WP squared, etc. So each of these subgroups looks like this subgroup, so this subgroup looks to this exactly the same way that this subgroup looks to this, etc. So it's self-similarity in some sense. So I want to explain the uh, linkage principle, which is enormously important. And this is an instance where this subgroup WP plays, a, plays an important role. But yeah, so I'll just, with, at, risk, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I think that these higher WPs are important. Uh, so this is just an illustration for P equals two. Okay, we get this. So now I want to explain the relevance of these groups for um, algebraic representations. So root, a root system like this determines a simply connected compact Lie group. And it's a much more difficult theorem, but it also determines, in a unique way, a split, semi-simple, and simply connected group over K. Okay. Yeah, I guess I really should be assuming that K is algebraically closed throughout, so you can just forget about the split business. And our lattice in, our lattice in which um, our root system sits is the lattice of characters of a maximal torus, and inside this we have the dominant weights. So this is a picture that I'm hoping is familiar from compact Lie groups, and the statement is that the same thing is true for any uh, algebraic split, semi-simple and simply connected algebraic group. So here is the case of SP4. So we make some arbitrary choice of simple roots. We get some positive roots, and then 
we get the cone of dominant, dominant weights. Okay. So in the case of a compact Lie group, these dominant weights determine, so via highest weight theory, each one of these weights determines in a simple representation, and this, all simple representations are obtained in this way. So I want to, exp so the, the Borel-Weil theorem t tells us that in the case of a compact Lie group, we can realize any representation as the global sections of some line bundle on G mod B, on the flag variety. And in characteristic P, we try to do the same thing. We take these global sections. So this is no longer irreducible, but it has a unique simple submodule, which we call L lambda. And so this gives us an association between, of dominant weights to irreducible modules, to simple modules. And Chevalet's theorem is that this is a bijection. So we have, just as for a compact Lie group, we have a highest weight classification of simple modules. So we saw this already for SL2. So when I was saying homogeneous polynomials, I could have said global sections of O of M on P1. And we saw that the Sockel gives us the simple representation. So the linkage principle, so when should I stop? 25 past, is that right? Or 20 past? 20 past. Uh, so the linkage principle describes the block decomposition of the representation theory of G. So which, which simple modules can interact, basically. So we consider rho, which is a standard and at the same time mysterious presence in representation theory. And what we do, we, we take this WP action from before, so this is the affine vial group but dilated by a factor of P. And we shift it so that it's, the origin becomes minus rho. And so this gives us the dot action. And the linkage principle says that two simple modules can extend only when lambda is in the WP dot orbit of mu. So this is a fundamental basic result in the representation theory of G. Anything that you do with G, you basically start off by hitting it with the linkage principle, and then you proceed. So in a second, I'll get to Lustig's character formula, and even to formulate Lustig's character formula, you need, well, not necessarily to formulate it, but for it to make any sense what you're doing, you need the linkage principle. And in the second talk, I'll explain a new proof of this, which is kind of totally different to any, any proof um, that we have up till, up till now. It's the basic thing. So here's a picture again. So I said that we take our group, so here P is five, and we take our group and we want to shift it to minus rho. So in this particular case, here's minus rho. And so we just shift our arrangement down to minus rho. So now we've centered, centered it at minus rho. We have our dominant weights, and what we look at is orbits. So this gives us a new reflection subgroup, and we look at the, these, the orbits of weights under this. And this, So here's an orbit, for example, of the zero weight. The orbit under this group, so you have to imagine that it goes off up, up to infinity, up there. And the statement is that these, all these simple modules can extend amongst themselves. So there can be non-trivial homological algebra between these simple modules. But this cannot happen, for example, no red or blue dots interact. So x between this simple module and this simple module is 0. So the linkage principle leads to a block decomposition, block in inverted commas. So the representation theory of G breaks up according to orb orbits of this dot action on, on the character lattice. So this means we look at all modules that have subquotients isomorphic to these L lambdas in, in this particular orbit that we're considering. And the trick here is basically to... Uh, so the, all these different blocks look somewhat the same, and so we can reduce to the principal block, the block of the trivial module. So just is, is L lambda 
Yes, so this, so say again. I, I just mean the SARE subcategory generated by these L lambdas. So, so this category consists of modules whose, um, all of whose subquotients belong to this set. Yes, that's why block is in. So this, is, this would be an example of the principal block for ca in characteristic five for SP4. We look at the orbit of the zero weight and we consider the full subcategory generated by these simple modules. And the claim is that if we understand this block, then many questions can be, many questions can be understood just in terms of this block. And I'm not explaining why. So Lustig's character formula is was somehow the kind of the, the, the guiding um, principle and motivation in this subject for about 30 years or something, or, and it still is. Um, so it gives us an expression for, so one thing that I neglected to say here, so you'll notice that, so these are called alcoves, the connected components of the complements here. And for each alcove, there is a unique blue dot inside that alcove. And so I can relabel everything in terms of alcoves. And I'll do so from now on. So that if, if I give you an alcove, the way you go to the blue dot is just find the unique blue dot in that alcove. So what this says is, so it's a character formula. So it tells us the class in the growth and group of a simple module in terms of known modules. So these modules, uh, we understand, for example, their characters very well. And this is an expression of what we would like to understand, the simple modules, in terms of these known modules. So this is an analog of the kajdan listic conjecture that was made in 1979, which was about simple highest weight modules for a complex semi-simple Lie algebra. So the sum is over dominant alcoves. So this sum here. And there's some assumptions that I'm sweeping under the rug on what A I'm allowed to put here, and P. So P shouldn't be too small. Uh, what you would see this for SL2, um, if you started writing such expressions, you could do so because of this Pascal's triangle business. And remember in the Pascal's triangle modulo three, for example, there's three layers of normality and then we have this big hole. And somehow, this, can, this character formula would be correct up until we reach the, up until the Pascal's triangle picture dif, um, differs from its quantum group analog, from its Gauss, Gaussian binomial coefficient um, analog. And this is an analog of vial character formula. So vial character formula is a very, very fundamental formula for compact Lie groups. And so this is a kind of analog in characteristic P. And I think that people started looking at this problem and thinking that perhaps there's some reasonably simple answer, but somehow it's just the further we look at this problem, the more complicated and deep it seems. One extremely important aspect of this is that basically it says that when you, behind all this is this WP, this affine vial group that depended on P, but once you do this, things become independent of P, which is rather surprising. So this character formula is true uh, for large P depending on the root system. So for many, for many years it was suspected that it's true for P at least, for example in SLN for P at least N. And then there was an enormous amount of work um, showing that it is true uh, for P large enough without being able to say what large enough means. And then Feebig in the late 2000s was able to show that it's true for some explicit bound. And if you ask him what that bound is for SL8, he tells you something like 10 to the 100. Okay. So as long as your prime has more than 100 digits, the formula is correct. And at the same time, we suspect that it's true for P equals 11. Okay. So there's a reasonable gap between uh, what we hope and what and then in 2013 and 14, based on some work, earlier work with Shukha He, 
uh, I was able to show that actually this expectation that it's okay for p bigger than or equal to um, the Coxeta number, so that eight in this particular case, um, is uh, very optimistic. So what this method produces is a kind of systematic way of producing counterexamples. And you can see using some number theory that these counterexamples grow exponentially in n. And so, you know, we'd hope that this is true for p bigger than 100, but in fact it fails for this very large prime number. Okay. And so, uh, there's still an enormous amount to understand, and we'd also like to have, I guess, a first goal, certainly for me, was to have a variant of this that is true um, independently of p, um, regardless of whether we can actually calculate the right-hand side. Uh, I just want to have a brief um, slide, so maybe I should speed up somewhat. Yes. Okay, so th these, these are certain Kajshan-Lutzik polynomials. I haven't gone into them at all, but here's a picture, and I'll just go fast. So These are some polynomials that are just computed in, in terms of this WP group and show enormous um, complexity, and they're fascinating things, and this does no justice to their complexity. So there was an equivalent formulation of the Lustig conjecture in terms of G1T modules, which was made roughly at the same time. And a philosophy, an emerging philosophy in this subject is that whenever we have these cartesian lustig polynomials, there's these new P polynomials, which we can... Uh, so, so for every cartesian lustig polynomial, this is kind of the, the characteristic zero thing. And there's a characteristic P thing, which we can define for all P, and these may be the same or they may not be. And in 2018, we were able to show um, a, a variant of the Lustig conjecture that's just, that's just true independently of P, but at the expense of replacing this um, very, very easily calculated polynomial here by something that's much orders of magnitude more complicated to calculate. What, what does it mean, scale? So this is baby Verma modules for G1T, but I'm not, not, I don't want to get into that. Um, and so, th this is all motive. It's, uh, did you have another question, Pasha? No. No. So, we, we, so this, this thing is definitely not independent of P, but when you have such a statement, you know that... So, in this formula, there's finitely many alcoves that play a role, and you know that if you have finitely many of these polynomials, then for some for p large enough, it stabilizes. So, if I give you one polynomial, then there's... So, if, if I give you a and b, and I let p grow, then these demonstrate a complexity for small primes, and then at some point they stabilize, th these p polynomials. And so, in particular, if I have a finite set of these p polynomials, and I let my prime increase, then they show a lot of weird fluctuation for small primes, and then they stabilize. And this is a finite problem here, and so this does, for example, imply independence of P again. Imply independence of P again for large P. But we don't know when large P starts. So this is all um, motivated by a story for... Um, uh, this all comes from a story for tilting modules. So I briefly mentioned them. So for any dominant weight, there's a tilting module. And these are somehow uh, much more... It's much more desirable to have a complete understanding of tilting modules than it is to understand all simple modules. Uh, and so Zergel, the, the result that Zergel didn't talk about in the CDM in 97 is the following, that for the quantum group, there's a beautiful formula for the characters of tilting modules in terms of certain Kajdan-Lutzik polynomials. And then last year, we were able to establish a p-analog of this formula. Okay, so... Um, so when, when we pass from the quantum group to the group, things get much more complicated, and this complexity is reflected in this p-polynomial. So the original proof uh, passed through Achar Rish, this amazing paper of Achar Rish of 147 pages. Achar Makisumi Rish Williamson, a lot of pages, and it assumes that p is bigger than h. And I am willing to admit that this is not a good metric, like for difficulty of mathematics or something, but it's really, these results pass through an enormous amount of mathematics. 
And I want to explain in the second lecture a short new proof which gives the conjecture for all p, so no bounds whatsoever. Um, and it's a proof that I hope I can explain in something like an hour. I mean, it's, the, it's conceptually very simple. Uh, I just want to briefly show you a video. Um, so these p-polynomials are very difficult to compute, but we can calculate way more of them than we can, could, in, so there's questions that we can answer with these p-polynomials that we could not answer before, and there's many of those, many such questions. Um, and so in 2016, I ran um, some programs on a supercomputer in Bonn for 10 months, and we got the output and then the supercomputer crashed, and has never been the same again. Um, and Lustig and I were able to make this conjecture on the characters of tilting modules based on, this, on, on these long calculations. So th this is a conjecture for the characters of tilting modules, and the remarkable aspect of it is that it predicts that they're given by some discrete dynamical system, like a billiards-like dynamical system. So if you want to watch it on YouTube, you can. Uh, so just to motivate this, uh, I mean, I won't exactly tell you what the video is representing, but here's the SL2 case. So is this going to work? Yeah. So these are the characters of tilting modules for SL2. And what, what, what this indicates, for example, here, this is indicating the, the character in terms of vial modules of this tilting module. Okay. And so if you animate this, it's, it looks like a kind of dynamical system in, in some, a, a reasonably boring dynamical system. Yeah. So if you're interested, so this is all generation one, and then this, here's the first point. So, This behavior here, just spinning off, that's kind of the same as for the quantum group, and then you see, here you see um, generation two-like behavior. Uh, so SL2 is known, and it's the only case that's known. <coughs> SL2, it's reasonably simple to... Yeah, so I'm using a, a, a formula for... Um, so th there's, there's something called the um, Steinberg tensor product theorem for simple characters. And so this allows us to kind of use Frobenius to generate many new, uh, many new characters. And you can do an analog of this for tilting modules, but it doesn't give you a complete answer. But for SL2, it does. And so it's a trivial task to generate these for SL2. A very non-trivial task to do it for SL3. But I, I'm just showing you this. Um, to give you some feeling for the fact that it looks like a, somewhat like a dynamical system. So now I'll show you this video. Uh, okay, so if I go back. Okay, so this is um, saying in very vague terms that um, a tilting module of some highest weight up here has certain components corresponding to these dots. Um, but so the conjecture is a, a, a precise dynamical system, and when you animate it, it looks like this. Um, and you know, we can check some of this based on computer calculations. We can check maybe up to about here or something, but. Uh, and somehow the computational evidence is overwhelming, but we have absolutely no conceptual explanation for these pictures. Um, so thank you. Yes. Uh, yep. For the Pascal's triangle. Yes. 
Oh, no, this is different. This is, um, so that, that, the Pascal's triangle one is for uh, simple characters. And this is for tilting characters. So, yeah, it looks, um, yeah. I mean, I can show you. I have it on my laptop. Um, yeah, it's somewhat different, but, but quite related. Yeah. <laughs>